this week on the Back Table Podcast. We want to make a lot of money. You know, healthcare is something that is potentially global. And when you get something that is transformative in medicine and the application is global, that company can do extremely well. So there's a lot of financial upside. More importantly, it's transformative and it can save lives. It can make people's lives better. You know, we're not, we, and not, not that there's anything wrong with it, but we're not investing into consumer beverages or, you know, fizzy drinks, uh, which are great markets, I guess. I don't know much about them, but we're investing in transformative healthcare to make people's lives better. Hey, everyone, and welcome to the Backtable Innovation Podcast. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on Backtable.com. This is our next installment in the Backtable Innovation Show, where you will hear stories from physician entrepreneurs who are helping to drive healthcare forward through medtech innovation. We are very excited about our special guest today, Dr. Oren Eloni Cheris. Oren is an anesthesiologist and venture capitalist in San Francisco with a focus on healthcare. On the clinical side, he was CFO of a large private practice in San Francisco for many years. As a professional investor, he was the vice president of clinical investments at AngelMD. And most recently, he was CEO and managing partner of the Global Health Impact Fund, a venture fund focusing on investing in early stage healthcare innovation. Now he's raising a new fund called Cura Capital. Today, we're going to learn about the mechanics of fundraising for a startup and on the other side, how to get involved as an investor. With that, Oren, thank you so much for coming on the show and welcome. Hey, Brian. It's great to be here. Thank you. So love to start off always with just a little introduction. Maybe you can tell us about yourself, where you live, uh, your specialty, your training, and current job. Awesome. So, well, you did a great job. So I'll, I'll just try <laughs> and fill in, fill in some gaps. So uh, originally I'm from New York, but now I live in San Francisco. I've been here for now 20 years. So I guess you can take the boy out of New York, but at some point, maybe, maybe you lose that, but yeah, I, yeah. it's been a while. And, you know, I got my, uh, I did all of my training in, in the East coast medical school and anesthesia in New York city. I also got an MBA from Columbia university before I moved out West. And I've been here since I'm now retired from practice but practiced anesthesia until 2020 and I'm full-time uh, working on venture capital and it's been super exciting and, and I look forward to talking about it today. Awesome. So your clinical practice, was that just, were you doing general anesthesia? Um, I guess just general anesthesia practice. Yeah, it was a, I was a generalist, but I specialized in critical care, liver transplants. We did a lot of liver transplant anesthesia, obstetrics, really you name it. You try not to pigeonhole yourself too much. Okay. Uh, no, that's great. Uh, so with your investing career, when did you get involved with investing? That's a really interesting story uh, because it's such a, it's such a lateral path out of medicine. But when I first got exposed to venture capital was when I was in business school and I got to do some work with a venture capital firm in New York City. And it really, it piqued my interest. It made me understand the value of venture in terms of innovation, in terms of growing the GDP, you know, all these these things that as a doctor, you don't really think about, but then it was really difficult to find the path into it while still practicing medicine and not giving up, you know, the practice. So it took me until about 2016 when I met the team at Angel MD to find a startup that was building a platform for investing for doctors. And I said, well, that's, that's basically me. That's my tribe. And so I was able to join them as an early employee and I was able to, you know, develop some networks of doctors and put together a process for understanding and evaluating early stage startups. And we actually raised quite a bit of money for, for companies and they've done some of them very, very well. So we're pretty excited about that. Awesome. That's great. You mentioned the effect of uh, venture capital on GDP. Uh, for our listeners out there, what is the impact that venture capital has? That's a really, that's a really cool question. So if you think about gross domestic product, you know, and every year we talk about it's growing and if it doesn't grow, say at 4%, you say, oh no, everything's terrible, <laughs> but we're, we're talking about growth, right? So if you have a business and it's stable, it's a stable business, it's not growing, but it's also, you're not losing any money. That's actually not GDP growth. That's just GDP stability. And so the only way to really get true you know, and, and sustainable GDP growth is through innovation. So you have to build new products, build new, new opportunities, build new industries. 
And how do you do that? Well, you know, for the big industries, they often rely on venture capital, private equity to support those efforts. Venture capital has a huge impact on GDP, on the country, on innovation with, within industries like healthcare. I mean, it's a big, it's a powerful engine for growth. Exactly. It's a powerful engine for growth. And, you know, you can look at it on a macro level, whether it's, you know, artificial intelligence, whether it's genomics, whether it's renewable energies, they require large investments in order to accelerate and become something. But then if you look at it at a micro level, each company itself also requires investment. And venture capital really exists to either seed really good ideas or to accelerate growth of really good ideas. It operates in that early spot. So that, you know, $1 can be worth, you know, $100 uh, of, of effect. And so it, it, it really is powerful. And the truth is that everything is a business. Everything has to make money. Everything has to show revenue and show value. And part of that is bringing in capital to support those efforts so that you can continue to support those efforts downstream until the point in time at which a company can be self-sustaining. Absolutely. That's a great segue. So let's start at the beginning. Why would a startup seek fundraising? Right. So ideally, if you're in a position where you have a startup, then you don't really, and you have a lot of money, then you don't necessarily need fundraising, right? You need capital to pay for materials, to pay for, you know, offices, to pay for staff, to pay for patents, licensing, and all of these different things require money. If you don't need money because you can figure out another way around, that's great. But it's often a very large investment. And when it is, the, the people who start the companies don't, don't necessarily want to take all of that risk on their shoulders themselves. So they're willing to share the risk and also share the result, you know, share the rewards if things go well. And so if you want to build a company that is in medicine and requires, you know, going through the FDA, it's going to require a lot of capital to do all of the work you need to discover your IP, protect your IP, study your IP, and then get it through the FDA before you can even sell anything. And so in order to do that, you go to the venture community and you try to raise money. And for the money, you exchange equity or some security or position in your company. So you end up taking on effectively partners, but you get money so that you can hopefully have explosive growth and be very successful. Yeah. So how much money, you mentioned that it takes a lot of money. Say you have a medical device that you're trying to get through, for example, what are we talking about to get through from the very beginning, from idea, inception, to prototyping, to, you know, proof of concept, first in human, FDA clearance. I know it's, it's a huge spectrum, but what ranges are we talking about? Are we talking about a million dollars or you know, $30 million, what, what would you say is ballpark? Well, so first I would separate a uh, device from pharma because pharma is much more expensive. You know, the studies uh, have to be powered well and you have fee three phases of studies, phase one, phase two, phase three. Devices, 510K pathways and so forth are a little bit easier, but still expensive. And, you know, it really depends on a lot of things, including the materials you're using, how powered the studies need to be, whether there are predicate devices or not. But, you know, millions of dollars is not uncommon. I would also say, though, that there are philanthropic or grant availabilities also for companies. So any, and that's called non-dilutive non -dil capital. So in other words, if you can go to the NIH and get a, a grant from them for a million dollars, that's not a million dollars of equity you have to trade for that. So we love to see grant funding and companies, of course, love to see grant funding because it doesn't dilute their ownership positions. So it shows the companies thinking about retaining equity that they can use later on to attract talent, to, you know, attract more investors. And grants can be perfect for that. We took a, we had a grant, a NIH SBIR grant, and they are great, but I'll tell you what, they are a lot of work. Mm -hmm. uh, they're a lot of work to write those grants and, and make a compelling argument and then secure the funding. And then when you have the funding, you need to follow very specific protocols, basically doing what you said you would do, even if things change. <laughs> hmm. But on the other end, it is fantastic. That can be the seed growth that you need to get to that level where an investor is ready to invest. 
Well, and it's really important as a startup, when you're thinking about bringing on money is, you know, it's not just about getting the money. It's when you get the money and how much you take on. And you never really want to take more money than you need to get through milestones because with each milestone you accomplish, uh, if they're major milestones, then your valuation increases and not linearly. Um, so if you can take $500,000 and get a working prototype to market, then don't sell equity in, you know, $2 million of equity in your company at a lower stock price, sell 500, maybe it's a little extra 700,000 and then sell the rest of that afterwards when your valuation has gone up. Right. So, so you want to be thoughtful about the way you raise money because you don't want to over dilute yourself or the previous owners. At the same time, you want to bring in enough money so that you can comfortably get through your milestones, understanding that you can't predict the timing of things. So you don't want to, you don't want to make it so tight so that if, if things don't all work the right way, you're going to run out of cash before that milestone. That's really important points you made. So generally startups will start seeking fundraising pretty early on. And when they look to raise funding, they're basically telling an investor, I need X amount of dollars to reach this milestone because they believe this milestone is going to be a value inflection point where they will be worth significantly more money at that point when they go to raise their next round of funding. And you tell me if this is true. The typical pathway that you'd like to see, I guess, as an investor is start off very start off early and then grow the company to higher and higher valuations every time you look to raise money. Is that correct? I do, but I, I think that it's it's you have to be careful because raising money itself is challenging. And so you don't want to have the hubris that the moment you need money, it will come flying at you. Mm. Right. And the market goes up and down. So there are factors like COVID that have nothing to do necessarily with the internal workings of a company. And so you don't want to be too, you don't want to take for granted the, the challenges for fundraising. At the same time, it doesn't make sense to take in you know, double the amount of money you need to get through a milestone because you just essentially sold equity at a very low rate th that you didn't have to do. Right. So, so I think it just depends. And of course, you know, if we're talking fifty, hundred thousand dollars early on, maybe it's not as big a deal, but you know, you really want to think about what those numbers look like. I think about it when you're doing a fundraise, the way when you're doing a home renovation, which is whatever the contractor tells you, you're going to need 20% more like ah, plan on it. Right. And so totally <laughs> if you're going to raise, just raise beyond that and you should be okay. And of course you can always go back and raise more if you're wrong mm -hmm. uh, or try to, but, but this way you give yourself enough of a cushion to hopefully mitigate those risks. Yeah. That's a, that's a really great point. And can you, just as an example, can you take us through a fictitious company or even a real company if you have one, you know, what are they, ra what are these companies raising from the very beginning? Say, they're starting at, uh, the stages are you have an idea and then you maybe go to friends and family. You're raising from angel investors, potentially at that right. point to get right. to, to develop your intellectual property, develop a first proof of concept or prototype. And then you go to seed stage or seed series A series B. These are terms that I think our listeners may want to understand a little bit better. That's a really great question. It's just mechanics, really, the mechanics of fundraising. So the friends and family or the angel round, those are considered rounds where people are investing typically small amounts of money, twenty, fifty thousand dollars maybe more, maybe less. And what you're looking for is essentially seed financing. Get the company off the ground, maybe protect your intellectual property, fund some early, you know, preclinical work, right? more professional investors are going to want to see some degree of certainty around the company before you do that. For instance, I don't really like to talk to a company that hasn't, um, re you know, obtained control of whatever intellectual property they have. Mm -hmm. No, that's a really good point. If you're working with, you know, a university or working, you know, with a bunch of partners, if you haven't secured the IP, then what value does the, does the company truly have? Right. And you're not going to want to take a lot of money at that point either, because your valuation is not very high, right? So if you take a million dollars when your valuation is only maybe $1.5 million, that's already two thirds of your company. 
that you've sold away. You have to really think about what do I need? What's the least amount I need to get through that inflection point? So you go to your friends and family, and that's a really important round because it's a version of skin in the game, right? I want to see that the entrepreneurs, they've put their, you know, they've mortgaged their home. They've taken money out of their 401k. They need this to work. You know, if, if, again, if you're an entrepreneur and you're like, yeah, if it works, it's great. If it doesn't work, who cares? I'm good. Like, that's not really a good feeling for a professional investor because it doesn't feel like you're going to stick with it when things get hard. That's a great point. And so, you know, if your parents put money into it, if your cousins, you know, there's a mm -hmm. lot of accountability that gets built into that. So, yeah, you don't want to fail at that point. You're thinking exactly. about it. I mean, you have to see these people at Thanksgiving every year or whatever. Exactly. So, you, you, you know, you're going to have to have hard conversations with them. Now, right. uh, you know, of course, everybody needs to know that these are they're always risky investments, but it makes you what you're saying is it's good motivation for the uh, entrepreneur to really drive this thing towards success. Right. You know, you, you, companies are going to fail. Mm -hmm. You want them to fail for the right reasons and not the wrong ones. Like a I lack think. of motivation. That's a like, wrong reason. Like I got bored <laughs> and I yeah. walked away, right? That's, right? that's not really a good reason. So okay. anyway, so, so you have your friends and family and then yes. you have your angel round, which is more formal. There are a lot of people who, who are considered angel investors and they're, they're not quite professional investors, i.e. working with, you know, corporations. But they invest and they can invest a considerable amount of money. Uh, and you can do that through angel networks like I did through Angel MD or Koretsu Forum or networks like that, or they can do them independently. And they can be a tremendous resource. They also can be great because they can have personal experiences that can support you. And they can be very personally motivated because they may have a personal connection, especially in healthcare, with the work that you're doing. So they can be really great allies uh, beyond the capital. But again, in the angel world, you're only going to get so far. And if you're trying to, you know, raise $10 million to fund studies, hmm. you really have to turn to the professional markets. And so I find that the angels, there are even angels in the series A. So these are the stages as you have these angel rounds and then a seed, a seed round, which is basically where, you know, we're planting the seed of the company to help it grow. So it's the early days. And then you have your series A, your series B, your series C and so forth until you have an exit. And that's when things start to get more professional because with each round, you typically want to bring in more money and at higher valuations and companies are more sophisticated. You know, in the series seed round, you're typically a company, you have a slide deck, you have some projections, but a lot of it is abstract and ideated, but not actually executed. Whereas as you get further down the road, you become more and more execution based and you have to actually show, show the progress. So theoretically, hypothetically, say you have a company, they go through their seed. Now they have a prototype. They may raise a series A and the milestone they would be raising on would be perhaps to get through the FDA to get right. to clearance. And that I've seen, that's a very common time to raise a series A is you feel really good about your prototype. It's demonstrated, demonstrated that maybe it works or there's efficacy in your app or your program or, or whatever you're working with. And you're ready to take on more capital to drive towards FDA clearance. So then you can start sales. And then I've often seen uh, series B can often be the time point at which you're taking on even more money to start driving sales after you've already been cleared. Does that seem like a pretty at least a, a common pathway that some companies take? I think so. I mean, you'll see some companies require more, more work in terms of their studying. And mm -hmm. so they'll, they'll sometimes do a series A1 and A2, right. sometimes even go into series B. But I would say as a general rule, that's about right. You know, okay. the Perry FDA clearance is typically a series A for them. Right. Okay, perfect. Uh, that's helpful. And then, okay, so you've raised all this money. Are there any, I just want to go back to the friends and family that you mentioned. Is there any dangers to raising money from friends and family? Like the obvious, I would, <laughs> I guess it depends I would who assume. Your, who's in yeah. your family, right? Um, <laughs> That's very true. Yeah. I'm going to break your legs. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I mean the danger, there's no danger. I think the one thing you want to keep an eye on is, you know, your cap table and you don't want to have too many names on your cap table. If you're going to continue to go through venture because a congested cap table can be seen as, as a um, negative incentive to investment from venture. 
But I don't think at friends and family, you're taking on a hundred, you know, I wouldn't be taking on investors that are putting a hundred dollars into a company. That doesn't make sense. So you still want to have minimums and, you know, you want to have a, a reasonable goal. I think that it's just the problem is, is that your friends and family round is not typically going to be people who can help you with your business necessarily, right? So they're like, we're in medicine, we do health tech. My friends and family might be lawyers or teachers, or they don't know, necessarily know anything about health tech. So they're, they're money, but they're not necessarily smart money. So, you know, I mean, I think that there are limitations to that group, but these are just really meant to get you off the ground. Now, as you grow, if your friends and family happen to be wealthy and they want to continue to invest, there's no, there's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, ideally every dollar you take, hopefully will be smart money. People who can help grow your business. Okay. That makes total sense. And on the other side, it's called dumb money. We're going to say that just so you guys know, but it's, it's not because the people you're investing with are dumb. It is because <laughs> we're talking about the the experience that a professional investor who is used to, you know, working with companies and bringing them to the next level, that is what smart money does for you. Yeah. I mean, maybe a better phrase, although it's not used, would be strategic money, right? There you money, go. Yeah. Money that actually helps you with your business instead of just the capital. But don't devalue the, don't devalue the value of the dollar. I mean, yeah. all of these companies need money to grow. And it's great if that money can come with advice and guidance and all of these other things. But at the end of the day, the guidance is great, but if there's not money with it, it's, it's not really going to help you. Totally. So tell us, what do you look for in a fundable company and what stage are you usually looking to invest and, and, and what do you look for? So, you know, I come from a large physician network and basically the idea between the way that I, you know, the, the idea that I approach investing is that myself, my team, and then my network can see and understand good concepts early, pre-market, pre-revenue, and really, really break down the science, really break down the product market fit and the market validation by understanding things like the patient experience. And then layering on top of that, of course, an understanding of what the business looks like. So really getting both parts of the, both pieces of that puzzle together. And so that really works well in an early stage because those companies, they're almost science experiments. You know, they have to get through the regulations. They have to prove these things before they can sell. And we can help them with that, but we can also see what's going to work and what's not going to work. And so that's very powerful. And most people don't have that kind of insight. So that's where I operate. And then, you know, we can do follow on investments. So what that is, if you've invested in a company, and then they're going back to the market because they've gotten through the milestone that you invested in them for, and they need more money to get through the next milestone. You want to follow on with investment. So the fund that I'm building at Cura Capital will do an initial investment at either seed or series A, uh, typically, and then follow on, hopefully to exit. There's a benefit for an investor to doing a follow on invest in, which is investment, which is that you don't get diluted. So if the price goes up, if the price goes down, as long as you continue to buy equity, you protect your position in that company and you protect, you know, you protect your investment and the value of the investment. So, so that's what that fund will do. But being an early allows me to, to see those things and actually has been a real benefit to the companies also, because as a doctor slash business guy, I've been able to help them raise money by you know, by talking to other investors and really explaining what we saw as a team as being their clinical value and their market value. So that's a really great space for us. Once companies get through the FDA, they, they do become to some extent sales and marketing engines mm -hmm. yep. and it's a different skill set, And it's one that we're not, we're not uh, ignorant of, but less, we have less cachet in that area. Uh, that makes total sense. I think you, you specialize in taking understanding the vision of the entrepreneur and and helping them get to a certain milestone specifically how important is vision for your entrepreneurs how important is it that they communicate their value add uh, or their value proposition to you and do you have any examples of companies that just kind of hit hit on all cylinders and what does that look like that's really good Those, that's actually two questions one is how important is having a vision and then the second part is how important is it to communicate 
with respect to having a vision, I mean, the companies need to know where they're going, right? If you don't, it's like, it's like, um, what was the Robert Redford movie when he was a baseball player, the natural, the natural, when, yeah. right. When he, he kind of looks out, you know, over the stands, he's going to hit the ball out there. You have to know where you want to go. And if you don't, how do you make the right decisions along the way? So, so it's important to have a coherent path in Silicon Valley. Everybody's like, you know, gets a little bit, you know, enamored with the idea of these visionaries. And I think that you have to balance that with the realistic challenges that lay ahead and understand and properly assess what those challenges look like. So the vision is good, but it can't be unmoored from reality. Mm. Communicating the vision is an entirely different skill set. And it's one, it's one I struggle with. I don't know if you've struggled with, but storytelling well, is a gift. And the people who are the best storytellers in my, my mind will be the most successful people. In this market, you have to bring people with you on the journey, right? Uh, you're not going to, you know, these CEOs, they go out to raise millions of dollars. That's a huge, huge deal. And I know that, it, you know, it can seem like, oh, faceless VCs, right? They don't, they don't really mean anything, but I'm a VC. And when somebody gives me money to and entrusts their money with me to invest well, I take that responsibility very, very personally. And so... I'm not just going to be a faceless VC. I'm going to be, you know, very involved in making sure I think you're doing the right thing and helping you. And so, you know, if you, you want to bring me along on that journey and you want to tell a good story, and if you tell the story well, I think you'll find that the doors open much better for you. So you're looking for good storytellers for clear milestones and what else are you, are you looking for? Oh, so yeah, teams. I mean, you want to see a team. Ideally, they've executed companies before. They've, you know, raised money before. They've gone through the FDA process before. They've exited a company. You want to see people in medicine, I think, that have notability in their field. Uh, I think that's really critical. But I think you want to look at, we want to look at the science and, and really the underlying market that is being, the market need that's being met. I really like when I see companies that are affiliated with, with name institutions, that's very validating. You know, one of the important things, Brian, is that again, separating from the storytelling because storytelling is hype, right? How do you take that and then validate the things that you hear and, and validation by third party is very powerful. So if I were lucky enough to get a write up in Forbes or something like that, and you read that you would feel much better about investing with me than if you just got my slide deck. Right. It's just, it's very validating. So when people are affiliated with top institutions, like here in San Francisco, UCSF or Stanford, you know, the Cleveland Clinic, um, or, you know, any of the other number of, you know, health academic institutions, that's a really great market signal. Teams that have worked together before is really terrific. And then I think you have to break down what they're doing and how much it makes sense. You know, like, are they taking the right steps? Are they budgeting the right amount of money? Do they have the right people in place to execute? That's great. On the flip side, are there any red flags for potential startups investments? And do you have any, any stories of that? Yeah, there are a lot of red flags. And, you know, I mean, the, the you know, the, it's, it's not really a joke. It's true. It's, you know, you look at a thousand companies for every one you invest in. So really a venture capitalist will say no much more often than they say yes. And it's hard. It's really hard to make decisions, but you have to make quick decisions so you don't waste your own time. And I, I think you want to be respectful of, of the entrepreneur's time. They're very busy. And if you don't think you're going anywhere with them, then they should be spending time with other people. For me, the, the red flags start with things that are just professionalisms, like being on time and being courteous. And I want to know that I can work with somebody. That means that they have to be able to hear feedback in a constructive way. I like to see that their materials are, are well thought out and well put together. So when there are a lot of mistakes in their deck, when they're making claims that are unsupportable, like those things just really like they, they're just, it's like turn ons and turn offs. Those are big turn offs for me. I, I think those are the big ones. I think that, you know, I really think that it's important to have a functioning board for oversight. I've seen too many startup leaders, not just the CEO, but you know, the people in the C-suite or the founders cut corners when they shouldn't and make, make really bad and ethically dubious uh, decisions. And that's not the business I want to be in. And I, I think that it's important that 
they have the guidance of people who've walked the walk and talked the talk, and that's what the board does. And if there's no oversight, then, you know, shenanigans can ensue. Totally. So tell us, do you have any, uh, before we switch gears to investing, what do, do you have any advice, specific advice for founders looking to raise money that might be, might be listening now, say getting ready to raise a seed round or even friends and family? Tell a good story and really think about, you know, there are a lot of deck solutions available online, you know, but what problem are you solving? I guess I asked three questions, right? Why are you doing this now? Why this? Why now and why you? Answer those three questions, you know, and if you can't, then do some introspection. But, you know, what's important about what, what you're doing? Why should I invest in this company as opposed to any other company? I think if you're entering a space that's truly innovative, then you have to explain why it's important. If you're ex entering a space that is already saturated with solutions, you have to explain why you think you're going to succeed where others are already succeeding and many more are probably failing. You know, you just have to tell a story. It's so true. You, I mean, it's almost, you really do have to be, uh, it almost is sales at every level of the game. Even before you actually start selling your product, you are selling yourself, your team and your vision. Right. And everybody wants to hear a story. Everybody wants to hear a story. <laughs> we call, I call it the ugly baby phenomenon. Nobody's going to tell you your baby is ugly. So nobody's going to tell you, you know, and, they, and nor should they. Let's, let's yeah. be clear about that. <laughs> right. Every baby's uh, beautiful. For, for anybody who's asking, right, they're all beautiful. But, yeah. but nobody's going to tell you your company's terrible, even if they think so, because it's just, it's impolite. And even if they really like what you're doing, there's a big difference between thinking you're doing something cool and thinking what you're doing is going to change the world or at least mm -hmm. be successful. And by successful, I mean, make it to market and give the investors a, an appropriate return. So the idea that when you get positive feedback from people, first, it may just be right social lubrication, but even if they do like what you're doing, hearing that is great and it makes you feel good, but getting people to write a check for $100,000 or a million dollars, that's a completely different game. And you really have to understand if you want me to write you a check for a million dollars, that's a big deal. And you have to be prepared to do a lot of work for that. And so you got to walk in without an ego. You can't think that, hey, I'm the greatest thing since Steve Jobs and you're just going to throw money at me. I want to do my diligence. I want to make sure that when I write that check, that I feel comfortable that you're going to do the right things to make it, make things successful. Oh, that's great advice. All right. So with that, let's switch gears. Let's talk about the other side of the, the equation here, uh, being an investor. So how does one, how does a physician or a clinician in general become, or anyone really become an investor? Can anyone be an investor? Do you have to be qualified? Right. So, so there are a couple of different pathways. And of course, there's the public market and you can just buy stocks and anyone can do that. You can open up an account online and you know, that's all pretty easy to do. That's not really what we're doing because we're investing in the private markets. To invest in the private markets as a non-accredited investor, you can only do Reg CF investing, uh, which is crowdfunding, traditional crowdfunding. And you can do that. And there are sites that do that, like our crowd and WeFunder and Republic. And you can invest whatever you want in companies. And there's some really great companies there. The problem with that is that you're typically investing with a large group of people and they consolidate you under one, you know, one name on the cap table and you just don't really have any influence. And so it's really much more like, in, you know, buying shares in Apple than it is being an investor the way most private equity folks are investors. If you're an accredited investor, what is ideal if you have the capital is that you can invest money into companies that you can develop relationships with. And that way you can get information understand what's going on and offer them support where your skills align with their needs. There are a few ways to do that. One is as an angel investor and you can either join an angel group and then they share the burdens of due diligence and deal sourcing. And that's a great way to put in money. Certain groups require a commitment to invest X dollars every year, but they're great groups. And, you know, you could check out the Coretzu Forum, for example. I've worked with them quite a bit and, you know, there's some terrific deals that come through there. If you want to be a more direct investor, then you really want to go the angel route and strike out on your own and make relationships with people. That's going to start to cost you more capital, but could be very valuable. And then, of course, there's more organized investing, which is VC investing, venture capital. 
So the big difference, and one of the things that I think is very important when you're making investments in companies, particularly ones that are pre-market, you're buying an illiquid property. So when I invest in a company, I can't get that money back. So that company is either going to be exited or it's going to fail. Now there are some secondary markets, but you're not getting like real value for your dollar. So it's not like Apple where you can go in and out of the stock market whenever you want, buy on the lows and sell on the highs. So it's a much different commitment. And one of the things that happens is that because you end up sort of binary, almost losing everything, or you have a, you know, or, or you get what you get, but you can't sell out when things seem to be getting a little bleak. You want to have a diversified portfolio because that's the way you stratify your risk. So what's called the Babe Ruth approach, which is that you want to have as many at bats. And when you're at bat, you want to swing as hard as you can to get as many home runs as possible. And if you can hit two home runs out of 10 in venture, right? If you can have two successful companies out of 10 investments, that's actually going to be good enough if the, if you've set up your risk profiles and your return profiles properly to do really, really well. Babe Ruth, by the way, was also a strikeout king. So, the, <laughs> you know, you, so in other words, like he struck out a lot, but when he got up to bat, if he hit a home run, if he hit it, he hit a home run and he scored and that was fantastic. So that's what we try and do with VC is we build a diversified portfolio. And when one of those companies succeeds, if it succeeds the way we expect, it makes up for if all of the other nine out of 10 companies fail. So if two of them succeed, we're sort of doubling that and then three tripling that. And so the need to do well with a diversified portfolio across the board gets eliminated. If you're only investing in one company, it's a hundred percent chance, like if whatever you get from that company is what you get, right? So you want to be diversified. And that's why I think venture is the best. The other thing about venture is that it's a managed portfolio. So with uh, the, my first portfolio that I ran through the Global Health Impact Fund, we sat on eight, eight of our 10 boards and we're very involved on a regular basis with our companies. And so we had information rights and we sat on the board. So we had voting rights in many of those companies. And that's a big deal, right? So you're not just giving them money and walking away and hoping you get a quarterly update. And when you don't, they say, well, we didn't really feel like it. So, you know, pound Sam, you actually, you actually have influence and leverage. And that's really important because that's how you protect things. You know, it's like dating, everybody's nice and looks nice and, you know, has perfect manners. But then once you're married, things can get messy sometimes and you want to be able to manage the mess and not just celebrate the greatness. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And so why should our listeners consider investing in startups? I mean, you, you've given a great overview of kind of the, the, the foundation, but what's the why behind it? What do you, what do you get out of it personally and, and professionally? Yeah. Uh, by investing in these companies? What do you feel when you invest in them and you join along? So I'm going to answer that two ways because I think there's a parallel, there's a parallel gain here, um, which is, are not unrelated, but they're separate. One of them is that I, we want to make a lot of money and, you know, healthcare is something that is potentially global. And when you get something that is transformative in medicine and the application is global, that company can do extremely well. So there's a lot of financial upside. More importantly, it's transformative and it can save lives. It can make people's lives better. You know, we're not, we, and not, not that there's anything wrong with it, but we're not investing into consumer beverages or, you know, fizzy drinks, uh, which are great markets, I guess. I don't know much about them, but we're investing in transformative healthcare to make people's lives better. And you know, you're a doctor, I'm a doctor, we've taken care of patients and it is a beautiful and intimate experience, but it has no scale. And this is scale. I'll give you some examples. One of the companies I've invested in, uh, has developed technology to monitor the oxygenation of a fetus when it's, uh, when a mom's in labor and it's non-invasive and could have a dramatic impact on the number of C-sections we perform. And of course, Doing an emergency C-section on a mom creates risk for the mom and the baby and, of course, an experience they didn't want to have. And a lot of times they're unnecessary, but the data we have is not adequate 
to differentiate between this necessity and not necessity. So that's transformative. And if the technology gets to market, in my opinion, as somebody who's been in the OB suite doing anesthesia for years and years, this could be technology that should be on every mom's, laboring mom's stomach. Um, another company I've invested in has a unique approach. Um, it's a molecule that can, um, in the lab has shown really great data that uh, affects the growth of glioblastoma. Glioblastoma is a brain tumor, as you know, that has a death sentence of about 12 months. I mean, it's, it's an awful, awful disease. And there's radiation, and then there's one drug treatment that has some efficacy. But even with those, you're looking at 12 to 15 months mortality. So imagine changing that. And imagine the impact on the lives of the people who have that throughout the whole world, right? I mean, that's a big deal. And because of me and my colleagues and the people who've trusted their capital with me, maybe that company will get to market. Now they haven't yet. So they're still doing FDA studies, but all of these things, when we see them, they're all potential, right? And we want to see that the boxes have been checked and that the science holds up, but that doesn't mean that they will succeed. There's just a lot of hurdles that you can't measure early on, but they can't get anywhere without that capital. So that's just two companies to, to name a couple, you know, the companies that I'm involved with, but just really interesting technologies, really interesting solutions, and we can be a part of that. And what's interesting is that you think that every good idea succeeds, and that's just not true because there's so many reasons why good ideas can fail, including a lack of capital. So talking about what clinicians can bring to the table, to the investment, to the company itself, to mm -hmm. the team. What do you see as the strengths of the of physicians as investors and where they can really add value to this process? So that's a great question. Physicians add value throughout the journey of the process uh, for the company. In the beginning, before you even, ma even made an investment, it's really helpful to get the input of the docs who are on the ground dealing with the issues that this company is trying to solve right? Is this a solution you would use? There are many times when people have ideas and you speak with the clinicians and the clinicians think, I would never use that. That thing is going to take way too much room in my office. I would never put this thing in, the, in a patient, you know, like whatever, you know, it doesn't make any sense. I already have something that's just as good and it's going to be a lot cheaper. You know, there's just a million reasons why they wouldn't use something. And if you don't talk to them and all you're doing is drinking the Kool-Aid of the entrepreneur, you know, it's really easy to get fooled. So having them be a part of the due diligence process and looking at the companies is really powerful. Um, beyond that, once you've made an investment with the company, my companies love hearing from my doctors. They love getting advice. They love, you know, speaking with specialists in their area. We've, we've helped find chief medical officers and clinical investigators for companies. And then also they can make introductions to hospitals because doctors are not just the people who understand the business. They're the people who take care of the patients and you know, write the orders. And so at some point you're going to want to get as many doctors using your product or prescribing your product as you can. And it's helpful to have them along the way for the journey. And where would you suggest a, a clinician start if they want to be an investor? Say they have no experience, but they like devices. They want to get involved and help build something. Uh, where would you suggest they start with a, you know, a part of a, a syndicate like Angel MD or something else? Yeah. So, well, I, to be, you know, personal plug, if you really want to get yeah. started, you can reach out to me and I, and I can give you, give you some tips and, you okay, know, great. in parallel with our Cure Capital Fund, uh, which will be looking at institutional investors, we're going to build a smaller doctor's fund not just for doctors, but, but basically a smaller investment vehicle so that, you, you know, it'll be something that more people can afford. It's essentially more democratic and you can be a part of it like that. And then through that, you know, be an advisor and get involved with companies. Um, yeah, you could check out Angel MD. You can check out Karetsu. You can, you know, JP Morgan is a big event every year in San Francisco that has a lot of events uh, within it that you can go and see various companies presenting. We have pitch events all the time. And I think the best way to do it is just do reading online. UCSF, for instance, has a big digital health awards uh, coming up in October where we've looked at 
I mean, hundreds of companies that have come through the transom to, um, you know, when, when an award, the Cleveland Clinic has a program, usually in the fall, you know, just get involved like that. I think there's, you know, there, there are definitely communities, there are Facebook groups, there are LinkedIn groups. You can follow me on LinkedIn. I post about companies all the time. There's just lots of ways to get involved. If you wanted to, just to answer your question a little bit differently, if you wanted to get involved more on the entrepreneurial side, there are programs like the Stanford Biodesign Program that uh, will help you learn how to be an entrepreneur and help you put together companies. That's always putting a plug for biodesign when I can. So thank you. (laughs) Thank you for that. But uh, on the flip side, is it risky? Being an investor, how should you go in looking at oh, when, yeah. you're inve- when you're investing your capital, your personal capital? Say you write a check for twenty, thirty, forty thousand uh, dollars. How do you view that? Should you view it as like this is totally discretionary? It may completely disappear. Yeah, kind of. And and so this is why I take it very seriously as the venture capitalist, right? Because you're you're writing this check, and I'm supposed to make sure that it doesn't disappear. But I think realistically, we're dealing with very high high risk companies. You know, the rewards are high, right? So we're trying to, you know, balance the alpha and the beta, but they are high risk and they can go to zero. And so you really can't write checks with money that you need to pay the rent or to pay your hospital bill or something like that. So a lot of people say that these kinds of alternative investments can make, say, 5% of your portfolio, maybe a little more if you feel, if you're feeling really, you know, randy, but this should not be your primary, in my opinion. Well, I mean, you should take your advice of your financial advisor, of course, but in my opinion, it shouldn't really be more than five, 10% of your portfolio because it can be really risky. Um, so I don't, I don't think you should necessarily like set aside 200 bucks and go to Vegas attitude, but you have to recognize the risk. Great. Okay. You mentioned the goal is exit. And when you say exit, can you tell us what, uh, what you define as exit or what is defined as an exit? Sure. And what's a good ROI for, for an investor? Right. So an exit is defined as the point at which your illiquid asset becomes liquid. So there are a few different exits. Some are better than others. Of course, a failure is an exit and your liquidity goes to zero or something, right? They liquidate and it's like pennies on the dollar. So that's bad. We don't like that. Fortunately, I've only had a couple of those and most of the companies I have have grown, which is terrific and unusual because they say in early stage, especially in healthcare, nine out of 10 will fail and they typically fail fast right? Because you run out of money. It's the companies that aren't failing that will succeed for a while, you know, before they have that exit. Then the exit can either be an IPO or it can be an acquisition. And so a large, you know, medical device company like Philips or Medtronic may buy your company and that's terrific. Or they may go to the markets and, and have an IPO and that's great too. The last way to exit is not really an exit, but they can have some sort of a licensing deal where they throw off dividends and and you end up getting capital back anyway, even though it hasn't necessarily exited, but it effectively is an exit because it, it returns capital. How long does it take to get to these exits? Well, I mean, first thing, it depends on when you're investing. A seed stage company is going to require longer than a series B company. And it also depends on what you're investing in. A pharma company takes longer to exit than a device company. You know, when we look at companies, I'm looking for companies that can have a credible path to exit within four years. And if they can't, as a venture capitalist, that poses a little bit of a problem because my fund is a 10-year fund. And of course, there's going to be a delta, just like when you're renovating, right? You need 20% more. So you, need, you know it'll be potentially more than four years for some companies. But if they can't exit within 10 years from the inception of your fund, then it's not entirely unlikely that they won't exit during the life of your fund. And if, if that happens, then that's not good for anybody. You've got to figure out what to do to liquidate the fund. Yeah. So, so there may be the, the company could be successful taking 12 years. But that does not align with the uh, mandates of the fund, because when you raise a fund, when you raise a fund, a a VC fund like like you have, you're promising your uh, and maybe you could talk a little bit about the difference between uh, uh, the limited partners or who are limited partners and what they want. Yeah. So basically, a fund is made up of general partners and limited Mm -hmm. partners. General partners are basically the operating partnership of the fund and they're the ones with the liability. So with Cure Capital, I'm one of the general partners of that fund. A limited partner is an investor, 
and it's a setup so that the liabilities are basically non-existent to the limited partners, not perfectly, but mostly. And they basically invest their money in the general partnership, in the fund, and then the fund uh, gets managed by the general partners and the management company. Okay. That's great. And, and I wanted to get back to this. What's a, this is important. I think for a lot of people, what's a good return on investment? Oh, right. So, so again, you know, everything is relative, right? And risk rewards change. So the later you come in, the lower the risk. So you're, you accept a lower return on investment. When I look at companies in the series C to series A range, I'd like to see at least a 20 X return on my investment. So a million dollars becomes $20 million. And of course these are projections. And so it's not like they're making some sort of commitment to that, but if they can't even on paper create a credible case for that kind of growth, in my mind, it's the risks associated with that are not worth it. So it has to make sense from a math standpoint for you to want to invest in it. You have to yeah. be able to get a certain amount out so that you can return a good return to your limited partners and general partners as well. Well, every, every, every fund is going to have a thesis. Now you can invest in less risky companies that have lower ROIs and that's okay. You can, you know, you hit a lot of doubles and triples. There's nothing wrong with that. As long as that's baked into your thesis and you understand what that looks like. But what we do is high risk. And there are a lot of places, a lot of points in time on their journeys where companies can be shot down to zero, right? If you don't get through the FDA, you're done, right? So. You have to mitigate those risks by making sure a company can return a high reward. So remember back to the diversification idea. If you have 10 companies in your $10 million portfolio and you invest a million dollars in each company, each of those companies can get 20x return on investment. So if one of those companies succeeds and nine fails, nine fail, that means that you have $20 million returned. So you've returned 10 million on an investment of $10 million. So that's a, that's a, you know, you've doubled the money and that's okay. That's pretty good. If you have two of those companies succeed 20% success, then you're returning uh, $30 million on the $10 million investment. That's much better. Right. And so, and of course it also depends on the timing, right? If you return that in two years, that's much, much better. And as opposed to returning it in 10 years. And the, the number we look at there is called the internal rate of return or IRR which is basically the amount of gain on an annualized basis. But essentially you want to know when you're doing your portfolio construction, that one success is going to make up for a lot of failures. And so it has to have a high rate of return. Oh, that makes total sense. Okay. I think that is a great place to stop. It has been fantastic chatting with you, Oren. Really great stuff. So I'm going to make, I'm going to say a little summary right now, and then you feel free at the end to add anything if you have it. So what I'm hearing starting on the fundraising side is investors want to see skin in the game. So investing yourself can really show potential investors that you have the right motivations and everybody's incentives are aligned because you don't want to disappoint, you know, uncle, uncle John at, at, <laughs> at Thanksgiving, if that's one of your investors. Next, most successful entrepreneurs are the best storytellers millions of dollars they're trying to raise and, and VCs and, and everybody wants to hear a good story. So, so being a good storyteller is, a, is really a critical skill to have because you're trying to, to share your vision and you're trying to not just share it. You're trying to get other people to believe it and buy in just as much as you do as well. And being a good storyteller is such a great way to do that. The three questions you say you like to ask, ask every entrepreneur, why this, why this technology? Why now? Why, why wasn't this done five years ago? What do you have? And, and then why you? Are you the team to get it done? And, you know, being associated with a good institution or having good bona fides is a great way of showing those things. As an investor, have a diversified portfolio. So the Babe Ruth approach, I love that. Uh, as many at-bats as, you, as, you, as possible so you can hit more home runs. And for you guys as investors, it sounds like you want two out of 10, uh, you know, would be, would be great. And if you get higher, it's just even better. Uh, but it also, on the flip side, it shows that the vast majority of these are going to fail. And potential investors, physicians, clinicians should keep that in mind uh, and really have a diversified portfolio. And it shouldn't be more than 5 to 10% of your portfolio is what I'm hearing from you. And I, I think that's, that makes a lot of sense. Finally, 
investing in healthcare can be transformative. It's something, it's the intangible. You're not just in, investing in a widget. You're investing in improving somebody's life. And that can be transformative. It makes it so much better when you succeed and you know you're improving people's lives. And on top of that, you get a return on investment. So anything you would like to add to that? Brian, that was a fantastic summary. <laughs> and and, and way, way less wordy than me. I ramble. No, so I got you. it from you. So it was your, it's you. your words. Uh, but uh, thank you so much, Oren. Uh, that was fantastic. And we'd love to have you back on. Uh, and, and we'll just hit some of these points and, and, and really dive into them uh, even more because there's just too, there's too much to talk about, to be honest. But it was fantastic chatting with you. Nice talking to you, too. I really enjoyed the, the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.